I know that biblical womanhood is really just patriarchy and historically it's never been good for women. And it's time for me to tell people about that. Bay. Welcome to To the Contrary, a discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives. This week we speak with Beth Allison Barr about the role of women in the church. Her new book is The Making of Biblical Womanhood, and it poses the question, what if everything we thought we knew about biblical womanhood was wrong? So, Beth, I ask you, to answer that question. Hi, thanks for having me today. Yes, indeed. Um, what I am arguing in the book is that when we look at the idea that women are supposed to be subject to male authority, which is what is taught in evangelical Christianity, that if we actually look at that from the perspective of history, what we find is that rather than being different from the world, which is what evangelical Christians claim, that biblical womanhood is countercultural, we find that actually all it is, is is the church acting just like the rest of the world for more more than 4,000 years. Um, biblical womanhood is just patriarchy. It's not biblical. So there's a short answer for you. If you could pull out a few sentences about the main point of the book, and then we'll get yeah. into details about the history and how you reinterpret text, scripture sure. text, and that sort of thing. Sure. Right? The, the the main point of the, of the book is really to help us understand that even though we think that women's roles, um, that what women are prescribed to do in the church, which is mostly to be um, under male leadership and not to be preachers and teachers and leaders, um, especially and even in some evangelical churches where women are not allowed to teach anyone older than children age. And so this idea that most Christians think is rooted in the Bible, we think it's rooted in Paul, we think it's rooted in the Genesis story. And my argument is that it's not rooted in the Bible. It's actually rooted in history. And then we carry our historical culture to the biblical text. So, so you, you are saying Paul and uh, the other apostles um, lived in a world or described a, a Christian world at where women had equal power equal to men? What I am saying is that the world in which the Bible was written was a patriarchal world. And patriarchy is the story of history. Patriarchy has been with us from the beginning of um, civilization. And so what we see happening in the Bible is actually, while patriarchy is the background noise, um, to what's going on in the Bible, we see a resistance narrative. And we can actually even see this in Paul. Um, you know, one of the funny things is that instead of reading that resistance narrative, what Christians often do is we read that background noise as being gospel truth. So for example, we focus on where Paul says women be silent and women do not teach instead of focusing on Romans 16, where we see women as apostle, as deacon, as teachers, as house church leaders. And so if we looked at those verses from the perspective of Romans 16, what we would find is that Paul can't be telling women to be silent because he gives them permission permission to speak so well but my experience is that biblical texts can be whether the old testament or the new testament can really be interpreted to advance anybody's agenda there are huge differences between the culture at the time that the old testament mm -hmm. and the new testament were written and today and that scholars can get, basically use that to get the Bible to say whatever they want it to say. For example, I interviewed a professor at a uh, Christian university for gay people in San Francisco a bunch of years ago. And she told me that the phrase that's usually used to prove evangelicals that gays are banned and they're sinners and blah, 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 is or at least one of the one of the uh, phrases in the, in the text is that man shall not lie with man the uh, the way he lies with a woman, 
And she said, if you interpret that in the context of the time, what it really meant, what, it wasn't a condemnation of gays. What it was saying was that men shouldn't treat men like they treat women because women were basically chatted. And um, it didn't have to do with men sleeping with each other. So my question to you is your interpretation uh, of, of text is, you know, moves forward your interpretation, which is more liberating to women, right? I hope so. Yeah. Um, I do think, I think part of the problem here is that when we think about biblical interpretation, that we have left historians out of the picture. Um, I think a lot of the arguments, even that you say, have mostly been you know, between, and not that I want to undermine the importance of biblical scholarship, but I think it's really important that we add actual historians into that conversation and to see how what we see going on in the biblical text um, is not only just framed by the language at the time, but is better fleshed out by the larger historical circumstances. So while I do think that the Bible is, um, is more we can interpret it, you know, its application is probably wider than a lot of us, you know, we try to make the Bible very rigid and therefore we get it going off in these very sort of rigid ways. And I don't think it is quite as rigid as we often interpret it now. But I think part of that problem is, is that we forget to place it within its historical context. And so I actually think, I think that what we would find is if we put it in the broader picture of what's going on, we would find that while we might have a wider range of interpretations, that they also all point in the same direction. Direction. And so if we look at Paul overall, what we see if we put those verses about women be silent and women do not teach, and we put them in the overall schema of his theology, and then we put that in the context of the Roman world, what we find is that he is providing an alternate narrative to um, the subjugation of women. Instead of telling women that they are under the power of the powder familius, which was the story of the Roman world, he says the powder familius, instead of having the power of life and death over a woman, he has to give up his life for the woman. And that is a, that is radically different. And so I think what we see is that the biblical text, it is part of the world in which it lives. But I think that the Christian, um, you know, the Lucy Pepiot, who's a systematic theologian, she says it's the Christian revolution in how the household structure invites women into the conversation and puts them at a table, which is radically different than the, the Roman world. So is that helpful a little bit? Yes, yeah, sure. That helps. Um, but, but still scholars disagree with each other all over the place about they do about the meaning of, of scriptural text but but on to my next question which is, <laughs> please tell us how did you come to all this what was your personal journey um, yeah. as an evangelical and your background that made you realize and and believe that women have basically ha have had their right their rights to be full-fledged members of the church denied by patriarchy. Yeah. So I grew up in the evangelical church. I grew up in the Southern Baptist. I married a Southern Baptist pastor 10 days before I started graduate school at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And he started at Southeastern Baptist Theological Seminary. So we had quite a disconnect in the worlds in which we were involved in. Um, but at the same time, we also begin to realize sort of together, although we came at different times along our journey, we both traveled this journey together. And we begin to see more and more that the way that the evangelical church pushed women out of roles, and especially the very rigid rules that they would impose on, you know, for example, like women can't preach behind the pulpit. And me as a historian, I know the pulpit is not something that existed in the first century church. You know, this whole role of preacher is not, you know, there is no senior pastor in the Bible. <laughs> you know, so this is a completely, this is a brand new, historically new um, idea. And so we have carried sort of our modern understanding about how these roles should work within our modern understanding of patriarchy. And we've used that to interpret the Bible. And both my husband and I, you know, throughout our journey, we became more and more convinced that what the Bible showed us 
um, about what women, that women were called just like men and that throughout history, women have always been called just like men. I mean, women have I've taught and preached throughout the landscape of Christian history, um, but we're no longer being taught that today. And it was really in 2016 when our world, we finally realized that um, the message that was being told to women in the church was really harmful and that we couldn't, we couldn't be complicit in that system anymore. And us speaking out led to my husband being fired. And um, that also led to me deciding it was also 2016 was the year of the um, you know of Trump's election as well as we started seeing the church two and the p movement really pick up after the me too movement you know me too and church two in 2017 and all of these things came together and I thought you know what I know that biblical womanhood is really just patriarchy and historically it's never been good for women and it's time for me to tell people about that well, so tell me, that's tell me about the church two movement what yeah. is that? So Church 2 um, sort of followed after Me Too. And of course, Me Too picked up, I think it was 2017, when Alyssa Milano tweeted, you know, if any woman has um, been sexually assaulted or some sort of thing, you know, tweet Me Too. And that's, of course, was the beginning of the Me Too movement. And then Church 2 sort of picked up on after that. And that was any woman who has been sexually assaulted or has been sexually maligned or because of her sex has been, you know, oppressed in some sort of damaging way in the church, you know, Church 2. And so we started seeing these evangelical women starting to come forward with their stories. Um, and this, of how course- many, How many tweeted back, by the way? I do not know how many really? tweeted, but I think it almost took down Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> you know, all of the women who tweeted it, you know, I mean, it's just so pervasive. I know throughout history that this has always been pervasive, um, that women have always been treated as second class and under male authority. And it's just never been good for women. And it's not good for women in the church. But we know so. that women are the backbones of every yes. church. That's they so do true. all the work. They raise yes. all the money with the baking sale. Mm -hmm. They uh, take their kids to church every Sunday. Lots of times the father doesn't go with them. Right. Um, so why do they put up with this? Um, especially in today, you know, in today's world, I could see it yeah. in the medieval times or something. But well, no, that's a great question. Thank you for asking it. Um, actually, in the medieval world, a lot of women didn't put up with it. Um, mm -hmm. That's, you know, they did speak out against it. And women, of course, today speak out against it. And um, But I think the reason women today put up with it is because we've been taught that it's part of the gospel message. This has been, you know, the idea of biblical womanhood is part of sort of the complementarian model, which really arose in the late 80s and early 90s. And was enshrined in Wayne Grudem and John Piper's Recovering Biblical Manhood and Womanhood. And what it led talk to- about, Talk about what the complementarian- Yeah, complementarian, it's- um, that thank you. Complementarianism is essentially, I would argue it's the same as patriarchy, um, but it is put within a Christian context and it argues that women are divinely called to be under the authority of husbands, that they are created in the image of God, but they are created distinctly different to have different roles. And those different roles exclude them from leadership and, um, and put them forever under the spiritual headship of men. And so that's Does the church have any answer to the question of what happened? What is it the church's burden then to take care of the women who are beaten by their husbands and have to leave with three or five children yeah. and no way to earn an income because they've been listening to the church and have been subject, you know, have been, you know, ordered around sexually abused, physically abused by their husbands? Um, yes, John Piper has a very infamous um, Desiring God post. I think it's been taken down now where he was asked this question, you know, what if a woman, what do we do with a woman who's abused by her husband? And his response was, is that she should tolerate it um, for a while and then take it to the church and that the church's responsibility was to take care of her. But what we see is that, first of all, the church doesn't. Um, the church hasn't taken care. Usually what happens is these women end up, uh, many of these women end up leaving the church or they end up so beaten down. Um, you know, there's, it's, it's really tragic what we see happening to women. Other women just live with it all of their lives. Um, 
and because they don't see that there's, they don't see there is any other biblical way to live. And so what I really am wanting women to hear is that they can be biblically faithful and not accept these teachings of patriarchy, which essentially are no different from what we saw going on in the Mesopotamia world, um, you know, where women were um, allowed to be drowned by their husbands. Um, you know, that was legally uh, able. And it's like, we really haven't advanced very far sometimes, which is the sad story of patriarchy. Right. So. And you're saying the resurgence of complementarianism happened in the 80s and 90s? Yes, it did. Mm -hmm. Okay. And was that reaction in reaction to the women's liberation it movement was. of the 60s and 70s? Yes. You know, it's actually, as a historian, it's really interesting. The two big pushes in the modern church um, to emphasize women's subordination within the church, one happened in the 19th century around the same time that we see the first wave of feminism where women are demanding the right to vote. And it is then that we start getting a great pushback in the church. Church. Um, and that's also actually when we start seeing women being translated out of the Bible, like, for example, Junia, who's an apostle in Romans 16, begins being translated as a man, as Junius, in the 19th century. And it seems to me there's a direct correlation that they're trying to obscure the fact that women were leaders in the early church to push them out. And this is exactly what we see happening in the 1960s. Um, you know, we know that the 1960s feminist revolution was a direct result of what happened after World War II, where all the men came home, try to push women out of their jobs. Women don't want to go <laughs> out of their jobs. And this erupts in um, the 1960s. Um, and of course, the push for the ERA, et cetera. And so historically, it is no surprise that we see a pushback against this, both culturally as well as within the church. And that was, you know, complementarianism. In fact, recovering biblical manhood and womanhood, its second title, it says it is a direct response to evangelical feminism. So, yes. Um, has the church lost a lot of women because of this? It's a hard question to answer. Um, they seem to have, we have seen a lot of research coming out short, you know, recently that had talks about the people who have left the church, these ex evangelicals. I did an interview with the ex evangelical podcast, you know, last week, I think. And it was a, you know, a lot of people who have just walked away because they can't find a place for them in the church. And it's sad because they don't walk away because of the gospel message. They walk away because of the structure of the church and how the church has damaged them. The initial response to my book, actually shows how many unhappy and questioning women there are out there um, because we, we realize the disconnect between what the Bible shows us about women and how God speaks to women and then what the church, how the church treats women. Talk more about how you, let, so your husband lost his, he was mm -hmm. fired because he, he stood up for right. your and his new reading of, of, of the uh, texts. And what happened after that? Yeah. Well, after that, um, we sort of went into really kind of a holding pattern for a while where we were both in trauma and trying to figure out what to do. And my husband began exploring new jobs. And when we stopped receiving our, we were receiving um, essentially severance pay, but they gave it out to us over a series of months. And we were asked, we were told that it was dependent on our good behavior. So we, <laughs> so I pretty much kept my mouth shut for a while and I still wasn't really sure what I was going to do, but I've been writing on Pathios on um, a history blog, a religious history blog called the Anxious Bench for many, for several years since 2015. And I started writing, you can trace my blog post. I started writing in the spring of 2017, I started writing, um, speaking out. And this led to a series of uh, blog posts that I started in January, 2018 on Paul. And I said, you know, rethinking Paul. And then that led to a series called Disrupting Christian Patriarchy, where I just said, this is just time. This is not historically accurate. And that led to me getting a phone call from an editor asking if I thought about doing a book or actually not a phone call, a text, uh, a message asking if I would consider writing a book about it. And that led to the making of biblical womanhood. 
So. And, and what has your husband been doing? All oh, I'm sorry about that. Yes, he is now a pastor at a very, very small Baptist church um, in town, still where we live. And he was a social work major. And so there was a lot of things about this church that attracted him. And it's actually also one of the things that attracted us is that they had a woman in the pulpit in the 1930s. Um, and so they're a Baptist church that has had a long history of supporting women in ministry. Yeah, so, Southern Baptists have allowed women to uh, be ministers, uh, preachers yes. for quite a while, right? They have. It was, that's part of what happened in the late 1970s and 80s with the conservative resurgence is we begin to see a lot of women moving into the pulpit space in Southern Baptist churches. And then we see this clamp down, you know, we begin to see the ordination of women. Um, and this is when we see this significant clamp down in the late 70s and 80s, um, pushing, you know, re-emphasizing the importance of First Timothy as well, you know, of First Corinthians, et cetera, saying women cannot teach and pushing women out of the pulpits. This is also where we saw the takeover of Southern Baptist seminaries, um, where professors that supported women in ministry were fired <laughs> and pushed out and they were taken over by more conservative, um, uh, you know, seminary professors who then begin teaching that women cannot um, hold leadership positions in the church. Um, we also begin to see in seminaries, women not being allowed into preaching classes. And all, you know, this is also where we see the rise of the pastor's wife class, um, that you know, that's women's place, that's what you learn to do. I think it's only the women who feel called by God to do more and they can't do more, as well as women who end up in relationships that are, um, that are, that are abusive or particularly difficult or end up with leadership at a church, which is misogynist, um, they're the ones that really hit this hard and it causes a lot of damage um, for them. But I also think this is a lot of reason why women stay in these churches because most of these churches, it's pretty innocuous. Uh, you know, it's background noise. It's not really what background noise. this patriarchy is background noise in our churches. It mostly, do, it doesn't affect a lot of women because a lot of women don't feel called to do these type of leadership and teaching roles. They're very happy, you know, doing what they're doing. Um, and many women don't feel called to careers. They feel called, you know, to stay home. My argument is that women should be allowed to do whatever God calls them to do, which means they are perfectly, if they want to stay home with their kids, they can. There's nothing but wrong with that. You're talking so, here mainly about white, middle or upper I am, class women. I am. That's actually a very important point. And I thank you for bringing that up. When we look historically at this movement of biblical womanhood, it only works for wealthier families and for mostly white upper middle class families. You know, that's the thing is if you carry it out, if you carry it out to other parts of the world, it just, it, it doesn't, it doesn't work. It's culturally constructed. Um, and it only works for families where, where women don't have to be primary breadwinners. Um, you know, with, you know, I've made more money than my husband for a long time, <laughs> and, you know, and it's like, there's nothing, there's nothing biblically wrong with that. Um, and so it's funny to me that how did it become biblically wrong for women to be, uh, you know, to, to make, to make, have significant careers of their own. You know, in the ancient world, the reason that women were seen as subordinate to men was because our bodies were seen as flawed. There, we were really deformed men. Um, is the Aristotelian view of it. And the early Christian church inherited that view. And in fact, that's the reason why women, primary reason women couldn't be priests in the medieval world and the early Christian women begin to be pushed out. It was seen because there, there was something wrong with their bodies. And that's why they were not allowed in these leadership roles. But this, um, what, so that, I, that is an inherited part, I think, of you know, that Christian world inherited the patriarchy of the world in which we lived. And Jesus, though, if we look at the New Testament narrative, what we see Jesus always doing is he's always, do, he's always lifting women up in surprising ways. I mean, he talks to the woman at the well, which he shouldn't have been talking to the woman at the well. Um, you know, he listens to the woman of Canaan in Matthew 15, when the disciples say, don't listen to her. She's a woman, you know, she's a woman. She's, um, she's not from here. She's a Syrophoenician woman. He'll, don't listen to her. And Jesus stops and listens to her and heals her daughter and tells her she's of great faith. I mean, he does all and these had, things. Had a female apostle 
who was denied by many men, correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, Junia is listed as an apostle by Paul. We also know the medieval world saw Mary Magdalene as an apostle. Right. They called her the apostle to the apostles. And of course, you know, we're not far past the Easter season, but we know that the resurrection story was told through the words of a woman. And that's how we learned about the resurrection of Jesus was through the words of a woman. So it is just, it's really surprising to me that we work so hard to push women out of these roles when it seems that Jesus was always showing us how women could be in these, that women were really equal to men in the body, in the body of Christ. Well, that, and that's a great note to end on. Thank you so much, Beth, Allison Barr, and your book about womanhood in the church and how it differs from womanhood in today's culture. Thank you so much for joining us and uh, good luck with your book. So that's it for this edition. Please follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and please go to our PBS website, which is www.tothecontrary.org. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, please join us next time. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. Be more. PBS.